Hello, everybody. This is the webinar on embedding food justice in urban food strategies and activism perspectives from Americas. And we are just waiting. We'll wait another minute or so for people to join, and then we'll get started. My name is Stuart Gillespie. I am a facilitator for the session and a consultant with the Food Foundation. Okay, I think we should get started. We've got a packed program, which is great. Um, as mentioned, this is the, the second, actually, of a regional, a series of regional webinars on urban food justice, exploring principles and practice of food justice across African, Asian, and uh, North and uh, Latin American perspectives and contexts. We have uh, a program which involves uh, introductory remarks by the Food Foundation, and the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. We are part of a partnership along with Birmingham City Council that have been focused on the issue and the challenge of food justice in urban context uh, over the last year. And we're bringing, we're going to be sharing a toolkit that was part of that uh, process later on. Um, and Leticia will give some remarks uh, outlining the, the initiative and the origins of, of the uh, initiative uh, shortly. Uh, we then have a panel of five excellent speakers who I will introduce one by one uh, as they come online. Each one, each speaker will have 10 minutes uh, to share perspectives from the region, from their work, uh, including two uh, MUFPP partner projects from Baltimore and from Araquara in Brazil. And then we will, uh, as I say, share highlights of the toolkit uh, demonstrate that uh, with you and then open it up for uh, questions and answers. Um, I should just mention a couple of things on housekeeping. If you want to put your name and your uh, location or your affiliation in the chat, please do so. Um, any questions you may have, put those in the Q&A uh, uh, button on the, um, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I think we can go ahead and get started. So uh, as introduction, Leticia, would you like to share uh, perspectives and the origins of the initiative from the Food Foundation side? And then we'll go on, on to Serena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. So my name is Letizia Petrovic and I'm a local food policy lead with Food Foundation. But over the last year, I have been working very closely with Birmingham City Council in UK on developing a suite of resources to support our Global Food Cities pledge that was launched in 2021 as part of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact that we are a founding member of as well as the Secretariat member of um, in Barcelona. And the pledge was really developed um, to recognize that access to healthy food is a basic human right. And we wanted to make sure that we are bringing cities together and ensuring that they are committing to addressing the systemic inequalities in our food system that contribute to food insecurity, poor nutrition in marginalized communities including um, those that work to produce food for others. And it was really the experience of the COVID pandemic that has shown a really harsh and hard light on the fragility of food security within urban cities like Birmingham and how those um, inequalities have been exacerbated in many communities. But we are very extremely um, lucky to be working in a city where the politicians really understand the importance of food to our city and that it's not just important for health. Uh, we also want to uh, emphasize that um, it's important for our economy and it's also important for our sense of identity. So this Food Justice Pledge and the following um, fellowship and the, the series of webinars that we are doing as part of this initiative came out of a series of conversations during the COVID pandemic where we were sharing with other cities across the world how difficult it was to feed people in, in Birmingham and how challenging it was not just because of what was going on in our own cities or in our countries but actually it was a it was a global conversation and we really wanted this to be a vehicle for which we can talk to and engage with cities in this space and this is how this idea of sharing the experiences and the knowledge from experts in cities not just from uk but from all different regions all different continents came about 
And we also want to recognize that even though for the longest time food justice was um, around kind of famine, it is actually a global issue for all of us now, whether we are high income or low income country and whether we are a city that's saturated by fast food or we are sitting in a you know, foods, foods desert. Um, it's an actually issue that affects every citizen across the world. And that's where this pledge is really coming from. And finally, we still have a lot of work to do in Birmingham. And actually just in last year, we have seen a 42% increase in the number of people who are in need of food aid and are using um, food banks. So we want to ensure that we are continuing the conversation and engaging with um, other cities and places around the world to understand how they have tackled some of these issues and also bringing some of the practitioners and experts on this topic globally in a really concentrated effort to drive the necessary change. And we hope that Birmingham's Food Justice Pledge is a living example of how we can collectively address some of these challenges. So we're looking very much forward to seeing this movement grow and getting more and more cities involved in this conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Leticia. And we'll move straight on to uh, hear from the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and Serena Duraccio is in the Secretariat in Milan. Over to you, Serena. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to participate in this webinar and thank you to the Fund Foundation, which is a longtime partner of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact for co-organizing this webinar. There is part, um, as mentioned, of the fellowship program of the MEFPP. Uh, so... For those who are not aware of the of the Milan Pact, the Milan Pact is a global commitment of mayors that were launched uh, back in 2015 as the main heritage of Expo. Um, it is um, the the pact uh, comprises a set of 37 recommended actions that are uh, clustered in the six categories that you see on the screen. Uh, in the next slide, you will see um, the current membership of the pact. So at the moment, we have uh, around 280 uh, signatory cities from all of the, the world. And here you can see some key figures from, um, from, from, the, from the commu our community. Uh, the next slide. Uh, so as I said, uh, the pact um, foresees 37 recommended actions that are clustered in these six categories and cities according to their political priorities can decide uh, on um, which uh, actions to focus. Um, next slide, please. And uh, along with the um, framework for action, we have also a monitoring framework uh, um, of 44 indicators uh, that uh, it was developed together with FIO and RUAF to support cities in monitoring their progress since they joined the pact. Uh, so this is a useful resource that, uh, that I encourage all of you to, to access. Um, next slide, please. So this, uh, as in uh, in this webinar, we are going to focus on the Americas. I'm going to show you uh, very quickly um, the the situation in these two regions for us. So we have North and Central America that, as you can see in the slide, uh, is composed of 29 cities at the moment. We have two sitting committee members, the city of Baltimore um, that is present also here today. And I thank them for uh, their leadership uh, in, within the pact and the city of Guadalajara in Mexico. And here you can see an overview from the last edition of the Milan Pact Awards. So the number of practices the city have submitted to the to the awards. Uh, in the next slide, you will see um, the, the South America region uh, that is composed at the moment of uh, 33 signatory cities with the two steering committee members of Rosario and Belo Horizonte. Uh, and uh, here you can see also the 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 special mention from uh, the awards of in, in South America. And again, I thank you, the city of Araraquara for presenting uh, today. Next slide. 
So this is just uh, a list of the activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis for our signatory series. Uh, and basically the, the secretariat uh, encourages the knowledge exchange among series. And we do this through different kinds of activities like the one we are doing today, for example. Uh, in the next slide, you will see, so the Milan Pact Awards is one of the main activities that we do, uh, is a prize awarding the most innovative actions of our cities. Up until now, we have collected uh, more than 600 practices, and this is the, uh, the distribution among the different categories. Um, next slide. And here is the report of the last edition that we did in uh, 2022. Uh, through the QR code, you can have a look at the winning series and the special mention of the last edition, but also some key trends uh, that we identified among our, uh, our series. And yeah, next slide. Okay, and last uh, last thing is the, the fellowship program that we launched um, last year. Uh, so basically is a uh, framework uh, with of capacity building activities to support our cities in their challenges and it, as i mentioned this webinar is part of the of this program that that we are running and i thank again the the food foundation for for this uh, for this for continuing working with us on this uh, within this program and last slide for those of you that are participating uh, in this webinar and are a city not yet part of the pact if you want to know more or reach us out uh, here you can find our our links uh, and our email thank you so much Great, thank you so much, Serena. That was excellent. Really good introduction to the initiative. We are actually on time, which is great. Um, we're now going to move into the main body of the of the webinar, which is a series of presentations from MUFPP partner cities in Baltimore and Ara Ara. I can't just say that word. Araraquara, and in Brazil, and we will intersperse those presentations with. Uh, insights and perspectives from regional experts from the region. Um, and I just remind you, if you want to put your name and affiliation in the chat, please do so. And any questions as you, as you think of them in the Q&A uh, bar uh, at the bar below. So we'll start with uh, Taylor Lafave, who's the, Taylor is the Chief of Food Policy and Planning uh, in the City of Baltimore, uh, Department of Planning and the, the head of the MUFPP partner project in that city. So over to you, Taylor. Thank you, Stuart. Um, hi, all, and thank you so much to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pack and the Food Foundation for inviting me to present today. Um, I, as Stuart said, am coming to you from Baltimore City in the state of Maryland uh, in the United States. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of explain how over the last 10 to 15 years, Baltimore City has worked to embed food justice um, in our urban food strategy. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so Baltimore City uh, hired our first food policy director in 2010. Um, at the time, that was one of the, we were one of the first cities in the United States to have a food policy director um, and started with just one person. Uh, we now have a, a team of six, uh, including myself. Um, but since, since the beginning, we've been, a, uh, since 2010, we have been a city committed to building an equitable and resilient urban food system. Uh, next slide. And we use food as a catalyst to address health, economic, and environmental disparities in areas of what we, we call areas of high food insecurity, what others may call food deserts. Um, next slide. Um, and so uh, as our work developed over the first decade of having a food policy and planning team, um, we were one of the initial signatories of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact uh, on World Food Day in 2015. And um, since then, a lot of our food systems approach, uh, as you can see here, has been shaped, um, you know, by the by the pact and what we have learned over time um, from other cities across the world. Uh, you can go to the next slide. 
So for the so um, from 2010 until the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, we oversaw the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative, and our work was focused on interagency collaboration across the city of Baltimore. Our Food Policy Action Coalition, which started off with about 30 or 40 um, folks from across Baltimore that were interested, you know, that were already working on or interested in improving the city's food system. It's now 600 plus uh, diverse, diverse stakeholders and continues to grow. Um, another tier of that initial work was our Resident Food Equity Advisors Program. Uh, this is a program that we started in 2017, where we work intensely with a group of about 14 Baltimore City residents over the course of six months. Uh, we compensate them for their time, and that work results in a, in a list of their recommendations that um, they present to the mayor of Baltimore, and then the city of Baltimore and our food policy and planning team are tasked with implementing to improve the city's food system. And also a big part of our work in that first decade was um, working with the Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future to uh, map our city's food environment and to map out, as I already mentioned, what we refer to as healthy food priority areas. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is a, a, a graphic that um, one of my former colleagues made, but that just uh, represents how we have worked to embed uh, our food policy work and therefore food justice across um, our entire city government. So our little team sits within our city's Department of Planning, which you can see uh, in the top right of your screen. Um, but as we all know, uh, food systems work really affects almost, it's very broad um, and it affects many uh, city agencies. So we have always recognized that we need to work across city government um, because of that. And also because, you know, we started off as just one person, we're still only a team of six. So we, uh, in order to get um, work done, we need to kind of increase our capacity by working with a large group of other uh, city colleagues that aren't focused on food policy 100% of the time. Uh, next slide. And this uh, this map here is our healthy food priority area map. As, as I already mentioned um, from 2018, we are actively working to update this map and we'll be releasing a new one in the next couple months. Um, but I wanted to share this one as this was an important part of the first decade of our work. Um, but two, you can see here, um, some folks may be familiar with um, what is called Baltimore's black butterfly. And that is that the predominantly black neighborhoods of Baltimore are on the east and west sides of the city. And depending on a, a map that you're looking at, whether that different demographics, it, it looks uh, like a butterfly. This, this map, you can kind of see that other maps, depending on other demographics that you're putting on the map, look like it more. Um, but we specifically, our work is focused on improving healthy food access um, in these neighborhoods. And you could look at a map of Baltimore from 100 years ago, and it would look, unfortunately, very similar. Baltimore is one of the first cities in the United States um, to have redlining and has historically been one of the most segregated cities in the US. Um, next slide. So that was the first 10 years of our work, and then the COVID-19 pandemic came. Um, and from March 2020 to May 2022, our team led our city's COVID-19 emergency food response. Um, the key part of that response was that we distributed over 1.4 million boxes of fresh produce at over 100 community locations in our healthy food priority areas. Um, and as you can see, that resulted in us distributing 180 million plus servings of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, it was unfortunate that it took a pandemic to have this happen, but what we were able to, what we learned um, from both quantitative and qualitative data and directly um, engaging with residents is that before the pandemic, we knew that residents in our healthy food priority areas needed better access to fresh produce and that that would improve their health outcomes. But as a result of this effort, we are both quantitative and qualitatively, we're able to prove that not only do they need it, they very, very much value it. And um, have, whether it's been through nutrition education 
or improved health outcomes, we were able to prove that through this effort. Um, we also um, won in 2022 um, Law and PAC Award Special Mention in the Food Supply and Distribution category for this COVID-19 emergency food response. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as a result of that work, uh, our team really shifted from doing a lot of more policy work to directly implementing a $40 million uh, food response. And we were able to take those lessons learned and applied um, for $11 million of American Rescue Plan Act funding to our mayor's office. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act, as you may know, was a, a, a federal stimulus package passed um, by the U.S. government and cities receive varying amounts of funds um, and are able to determine how they want to use them. So we applied and thankfully received a little over $11 million of funding to implement our strategy. Um, this is really a once in a generation investment in our city's food system. And from the start, we've had equity as a foundation of this response uh, as we work towards short and long-term outcomes. Um, you can go to the next slide. So it, it, it took us uh, about a year and a half to move about 13 different contracts and grant agreements through our city's bureaucracy. As I'm sure many of you um, can resonate with, that was not a quick process. But as of this past uh, August 2023, we have stood up all five of our pilot programs that we are implementing with this funding. Um, we are continuing uh, produce box distributions uh, at 32 community sites in our healthy food priority areas. We are implementing an online SNAP produce incentive program. So residents um, that are on SNAP or what folks may call food stamps um, can have fresh produce and healthy food delivered directly to their door. We have greatly expanded the amount of nutrition incentives at farmers markets across our city. Um, we are funding a pilot food is medicine program at uh, a hospital um, in South Baltimore. And we secured a long-term 15 year lease on seven acres of parkland and have granted um, $1.5 million to build out uh, the first farm incubator in our city called the Black Butterfly Teaching Farm. Um, next slide. And I'm, I, that's it, I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much um, for having me today and look forward to question and answers later on. Great, thank you very much, Taylor. That was excellent, a great start. Uh, the first MUFP city for today. Um, we're gonna go straight on to Karen, Karen Washington, who is a farmer, a political activist, a community organizer from New York, uh, co-owner of Rise and Root Farm and co-founder of Black Urban Growers. Over to you, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. So yes, hi everyone, my name is Karen Washington. I tell people I'm a farmer, I grow food, I feed people body and mind. Um, I have this quote that says, the urgency of growing food is no longer a local movement, but a global one. The aim for cities and countries is not to grow food to feed themselves, but to help build a food system in which people are fed and hunger and poverty are no more. And I made that statement because I live in the greatest country in the world where we grow enough food and we waste enough food, yet that food is not getting down to the people that need it the most. And so a lot of us started to question the food system. Next slide. So my relationship to food at one point was the fact that um, my mom was a good cook and everything came from the grocery store. And it wasn't until uh, the early 1980s when I started getting involved in the community garden movement at one time, New York City had over 15,000 vacant lots, mostly in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. Those that left, they call it white flights. Those that remained turned these empty lots into community gardens. But while I was in my community garden, thinking about food, what I was also looking at is some of the social issues that were happening. Social issues around housing, the environment, the health, uh, economics, and realize that if we're gonna do this work correctly, 
we cannot just concentrate on food alone. Next slide. And so my work along with others have been on three pillars, food justice, food sovereignty, and food apartheid. So let's look at the first, food justice. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about food justice. I tell people, you know what, it doesn't exist. And I say that because food justice has been co-opted. People have used the term food justice to pad their RFPs, their mission and their vision statements. But for me, if you look at the definition of food justice, it's the transformation of the food system to eliminate some of the disparities and inequities we often see in underserved communities. And I say that because if you look at the word transformation, if you are working on food justice, food justice is a movement. And so if you're working in terms of food justice, you have to be actively working on dismantling the social injustices that you see. The same with food sovereignty, another term that has been co-opted. Everyone says, oh, you know, we're doing food justice work. Now we're doing food sovereignty work. And many people found it offensive because food sovereignty was started in the global South from peasants and farmers who for so long who are working to be self-governed. So for me, full justice, is, full sovereignty is the right for self-governance, to control one's own food, land, and well-being. The third is food apartheid. Now I coined that term food apartheid because people told me that I lived in a food desert. And I just wanna sort of make this clear because um, I had to call on to my friends in Baltimore, Chicago, Philly, do we really live in a desert? Because people were telling us that food desert meant that we didn't have access to food, we didn't have uh, supermarkets, and we had to go a long way to travel. When in essence, we do have food. We have the junk food, we have the processed food, we have the fast food. What we don't have <clears throat> are healthy food options. And I coined that term because I want people to understand that it was a caste system based on three things, race, the color of your skin, how much money you have, economics, and where you live. And that determines one's access to healthy, nutritious food. Next slide. And so if we look at those three pillars, again, food justice, food sovereignty, food apartheid, these are movements. And so if we're going to dismantle the food system, we have to understand that we have to be actively involved in dismantling the social injustices that we see. The social injustice that we see along race, gender, class, the lack of opportunity to be self-sufficient and self-reliant, to have control of what we put in our bodies, the lack of access to land. And this is a huge problem in urban areas because it's very political. Wealth inequality. There is a 14 to one wealth gap here in the United States when it comes to economics and wealth. The lack of understanding the historical content of trauma and also the historical content of the history on how this food system was built, built on the backs of blacks and enslaved people. And again, power. Next slide. And so when we're talking about how can the food system change, because time and time again, we've been asked that, you know, if you want to be healthy, all you have to do is give up soda and drink water, exercise, and grow a little food. And all of a sudden, you'll be more healthier without looking at the social determinants that reinforce racism in today's society. And we've been told time and time again, is that the food system is broken and needs to be fixed. And I used to believe, and many of us used to believe in that. No, it doesn't need to be fixed. It needs to change. And that change happens and is happening now with putting power back into the community. The food system will only change if power goes back into the hands of the community and the people who are totally affected. But wait a second. Power is like a drug and people who have power, they want to give it up. But in order to make change, that has to happen. And it's going to happen three ways. Number one, either people with power are going to share it. They're going to give it up. 
or is going to be taken away. And, and that is going to be the new food revolution because you cannot continue to prevent people from eating healthy. You cannot continue to see people who are poor, who are hungry without them taking a stance. So this food system movement will change because for the first time people understand collective power within the community, that they're the voices that make the difference and that is where change is gonna happen. Next slide. And so what are some of the challenges that we're seeing folks? So some of the challenges that we're seeing with, when it comes to growing food is the fact that we have an aging population. The average age of a farmer in the United States is 62 years of age. We have a capitalistic system, a food system that is extractive and exploitative. And agriculture is pays a big part in climate change and the pollution that we see on our land and in our waterways. We have a food system that has created an increase in dye related diseases that are now showing up in our young people. We are facing the effects of climate change, drastically changing the way we grow our own food. And then folks, there is the politics of food weighing on land development versus growing food. Food is political, land access is political and labor. Understand the cost of growing food and who is growing our food? And last but not least, why are we still fighting hunger and poverty? Next slide. But there are people out there. There are people out there taking to the streets, protesting, demanding change. They're not sitting back and allowing a full system to impact their lives. And this is done at the grassroots level from labor people, from people in restaurants and food packaging companies fighting for the right to be self-sufficient and self-reliant and also the right to make their own decision when it comes to food. This movement is going to change because of the voices and the commitment of community, especially underserved community to make change. That's it, thanks for having me. And that's all I got to say. Great, thank you so much, Karen, that was excellent. I really like that <clears throat> focus on the so-called broken food system. It's not broken, it's the wrong system. It can't be repaired, it needs to be changed. I think that's absolutely key. We hear that cliche far too often. Uh, and it's just plain Boa tarde, é uma imensa alegria estar falando com vocês, atores tão potentes discutindo um tema que é muito precioso, né, que é a justiça alimentar. Então, neste, nesse cenário que a fome é, atravessa o mundo, diferente é, que seja, como foi dito aqui, países ricos ou pobres, a fome é o nosso maior desafio. Então é muito importante estar compartilhando qual é a estratégia que a gente tem usado aqui em Araraquara para promover a justiça alimentar. É, para que todos saibam, Araraquara é uma cidade de médio porte, mas que também enfrenta grandes desafios com relação aos sistemas alimentares. É, para vocês terem uma ideia, Araraquara tem cerca de 240 mil habitantes e destes, 50, cerca de 50 mil habitantes têm, a, a partir de dados do Cadastro Único, que é um, uh, um indicador da pobreza na cidade, 50 mil pessoas em Araraquara sofrem com a fome, com a desigualdade. E por isso nós criamos né, de forma intersetorial a estratégia Araraquara Sem Fome. Uma estratégia que está elencada em quatro módulos. O primeiro módulo vai diretamente é, falando do combate à fome, né, na distribuição de alimentos e também na inclusão social, 
visto que a fome não se trata apenas de é, a falta de alimentos, mas também das condições econômicas, ambientais, sociais é, que elas acometem. Né? Isso implica aí o quanto é difícil a gente falar de sistemas alimentares, ou seja, não existe uma resposta simples para um problema tão complexo, né? mas é para isso que aqui nós estamos para discutir dentro de todas as variáveis, quais os caminhos que a gente mitiga a fome. Eu gostaria muito de falar que o do, do, das políticas de combate à fome, de distribuição de alimentos, eu dou destaque para duas. Uma que se chama Bolsa Cidadania, que é um programa de inclusão social no qual a gente qualifica as famílias para que tenha inserção ao mercado de trabalho. Mas antes disso, elas recebem uma cesta, um, um valor, é, para que elas possam comprar os seus alimentos. Né? Em contrapartida, elas têm que estar matriculadas, os seus filhos na escola, fazer os acompanhamentos médicos, ou seja, que elas se qualifiquem também né, e saiam desse é, sistema de pobreza. Outra medida importante que a gente tem, e já foi falado aqui por, pra, pra, por outras pessoas, é o banco de alimentos. Hoje o nosso Banco de Alimentos faz um trabalho excepcional na, na, no combate ao desperdício de alimento. Para vocês terem uma ideia, hoje a nossa cidade é, arrecada é, de alimentos que seriam desperdiçados cerca de 120 mil toneladas por mês. Esses alimentos vão, são processados e distribuídos para as famílias. Além disso, nós trabalhamos com a educação alimentar, porque não se trata apenas de tirar esse alimento que seria desperdiçado, que não tem valor comercial, mas sim educar a população também para a importância do aproveitamento integral dos alimentos. Então, essa política vai, né, que é o módulo 1, a garantia do direito humano à alimentação. Por quê? Essas famílias que sofrem com a pobreza e com a fome são, na sua maioria, mulheres, né, é, negros, e também temos os jovens, e a gente tem que pensar nessa população. E muitas vezes esses jovens que estão na situação de pobreza sofrem muito com situações que levam a, ao acometimento de crimes e ficam vulneráveis. Nesse sentido, nós também trabalhamos é, com a inserção desses jovens no programa Filhos do Sol. O nosso segundo programa, a gente tem a agricultura familiar. Nosso município é um município relativamente ligado ao agronegócio, no entanto, também de forte é, modelo de agricultura familiar. E a nossa política trabalha muito para a inserção é, da, dos agricultores familiares, através das compras públicas de alimentos, ou seja, através do que nós compramos da nossa agricultura familiar, nós distribuímos a, a população das periferias da cidade. É, e como que é feito isso? Nós levantamos juntos com, com os agricultores qual é a produção, né? quais são os desafios da agricultura, como que a gente pratica uma agricultura sustentável que possa atender também as famílias vulneráveis. E nesse sentido, nós temos programas tanto de compra de alimentos, que nós chamamos de PEMAIS, que é o Programa Municipal de Aquisição de Interesse Social, e nele nós compramos os hortifrutis da agricultura familiar e distribuímos para a população para que não, as famílias não recebam apenas é, uma cesta básica baseada em carboidratos, mas que também tenham as vitaminas. E essas vitaminas a gente trabalha aí com o PEMAIS, Tá. E de que forma que a gente garante a sustentabilidade é, é, agrícola? A gente garante fazendo as análises de solo, fornecendo aos agricultores é, incentivos como é, maquinários para a preparação de solo, é, instrução e acompanhamento na produção, de modo que a gente consiga, de fato, ter um alimento seguro, saudável e que cumpra a sua função social, econômica e social. Né? Então, esse é o segundo módulo, a gente pensar segurança alimentar baseada na agricultura. 
Outro módulo também que é muito importante, a gente sabe que o mundo é acometido por situações econômicas que não favorecem a justiça é, alimentar. Nesse sentido, a gente também promove, através da economia criativa e solidária, programas de inserção, né? no qual a gente qualifica as pessoas vulneráveis né? a, para é, entrar no novo mercado de trabalho. Então, isso também é uma maneira, um modo que a gente tem encontrado para diminuir a pobreza e assim também a fome. E no último modo que a gente entende, né, o nosso governo, o governo do, do prefeito Edinho entende, é a questão da solidariedade. Então é impossível a gente fazer o combate à fome sozinhos, é preciso que a gente tenha uma rede de solidariedade que nos motive a fazer o combate à fome. Então, esse é, em, em suma, a estratégia Araraquara Sem Fome, ou seja, uma estratégia intersetorial de combate à fome, à pobreza. E isso não quer dizer que seja uma estratégia findada, né, que está pronta, completa, não, ela a todo momento ela é olhada e vendo os desafios dia a dia que a cidade encontra para a gente encontrar os melhores caminhos para o combate à fome e pela justiça alimentar. Eu vou apresentar para vocês um pequeno vídeo que vai dar um pouco, uma visão um pouco melhor dos nossos programas e ele está traduzido, acho que vai facilitar bastante para vocês. É, eu vou passar aqui rapidinho. A inclusão e o desenvolvimento social são prioridades na gestão do prefeito Edinho em Araraquara. A cidade que foi referência na defesa da vida durante a pandemia de Covid-19 pelas medidas certeiras tomadas pela prefeitura em tempo recorde, sabe que só pode ser justa e humana se garantir a seu povo acesso a direitos básicos, reduzir a pobreza e as desigualdades sociais. Por isso, a Prefeitura de Araraquara desenvolve políticas públicas, projetos e programas que integram a estratégia Araraquara Sem Fome e atendem a sua população de maior vulnerabilidade. Fazem parte da estratégia iniciativas como Filhos do Sol, que visa transferência de renda, oferta de ações socioeducativas, qualificação profissional e vivência no mundo do trabalho a jovens entre 12 a 21 anos em situação de extremo risco pessoal e social. Filhos do Sol, por um novo amanhã. Já o programa Jovem Cidadão oferece estágio remunerado na administração direta, indireta e em órgãos conveniados com a Prefeitura a estudantes dos ensinos médio, técnico ou superior, a partir de 16 anos ou mais. Fatores socioeconômicos estão entre os critérios para a seleção dos estagiários. Jovem Cidadão, o futuro começa no presente. A Prefeitura também criou o Bolsa Cidadania, que é disponibilizado por meio de um cartão usado para a compra de alimentos. Entre as condições para ser beneficiário estão a frequência escolar dos filhos e o acompanhamento regular da família em serviços de saúde e também cursos de inclusão com foco na requalificação profissional e educação. Bolsa Cidadania, um gesto de solidariedade. E a solidariedade é o que não falta no PIS, o Programa de Incentivo à Inclusão Social e Produtiva, Frentes da Cidadania, voltado à qualificação para a reinserção no mercado de trabalho de quem sofre com o desemprego e a exclusão social. PIS, Frentes da Cidadania, porque a justiça social não pode esperar. Outro programa voltado à segurança alimentar é o P+. A Prefeitura adquire hortifrutis de pequenos produtores dos assentamentos de Araraquara e região e repassa para famílias atendidas pelos CRAS. Assim, estimula a agricultura familiar e garante alimentação saudável a quem mais precisa. P+, somando com você! E com o programa Novos Caminhos, a Prefeitura oferece uma nova perspectiva de vida e possibilidade de reintegração social às pessoas em situação de rua, garantindo desde abordagem e acolhimento até encaminhamento para os serviços públicos. Novos Caminhos, um novo olhar. Além de todas essas iniciativas para combater um inimigo antigo, a Prefeitura criou os apoiadores de combate à dengue, reunindo trabalhadores em situação de desemprego que foram contratados para combater o Aedes aegypti. 
E entre as ações de enfrentamento da pandemia, 400 apoiadores do combate ao coronavírus foram contratados emergencialmente para ajudar na implantação e manutenção do Hospital de Solidariedade. Em tempos difíceis, a cidade foi modelo para o país e para o mundo na saúde e também no combate à fome, com a criação da Rede de Solidariedade, que uniu o poder público e a sociedade civil e distribuiu mais de 55.200 básicas à população necessitada, além de mais de 143 mil kits. I just I wasn't sure how much there there in the film. That's that's fine. We can finish if it's just a minute or so. That's fine. Thank you. Obrigado. Ok. Perfeito. Esse é o nosso compromisso aí com uma justiça alimentar. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you, uh, Silvani. That was great. I'm, uh, I, I wasn't aware of the. Um, we didn't mention the Portuguese subtitles, so, but thank you very much. That was great, great insight uh, from your perspective in Araraquara. Uh, we will now move over to our fourth uh, panelist, Elisabetta Racine. Elisabetta is a professor of nutrition at uh, the University of Brasilia. She is a uh, president of the Brazilian Food and Nutrition Security Council, CONSEA, and she's a steering committee member of the on the uh, high level panel of experts food security and nutrition of the committee on food security among many other things thank you very much elizabeth over to you thank you Stuart. thank you for the invitation and uh, well okay you work in 10 minutes uh, uh, as you said i am president of our national council and the national council is part of uh, a national system of food and nutrition security. And uh, the system aims to organize and coordinate all sectors that are related to food and nutrition security policies. And uh, it has two pillars. One of the pillars is the social participation, and the other one is, of course, the intersectoral, intersectorality. Well, uh, the system uh, is being implemented since 2006, and uh, it would be possible to present in the time available, so I have decided to focus on a few specific initiatives. Um, I'm going to present some data about Brazil and uh, national public policy initiatives that are underway aim to realize the human right to adequate food that for us it's the not the synonymous but is related to food uh, food justice these initiatives and policies has the potential to promote the commitment of local governments to urban food policies and food justice and in Brazil, as in most countries, food as a urban planning issues, issue is still very fragile and underappreciated. All the information and data we have shows that in the cities, hunger and all forms of malnutrition are expression of inequalities and the social injustice. And and on the other side, almost 85% of the Brazilian population lives in urban areas. Data from 2022 indicated that 33 million people in Brazil were severe food insecure. That is, they are suffering from hungry. And 8% of these 32 million people were living in cities. And who are these people? The majority live in households headed by human, and the situation is even worse when these women are black, have low levels of education and precarious conditions of jobs and employment. Households with children under the age of 10 have a higher risk of severe food insecurity. As in other countries, in low-income families spend on food represent around two-thirds of total household spenders. The other side of this coin is the 62 percent uh, of the Brazilians are overweight or obese, 
and ob almost 30% of this increase in obesity is due to consumption of ultra-processed foods, and this consumption is high in urban areas. In Brazil, 57%, around 121 million people, uh, lives in 319 municipalities. This represents only 6% of the total of cities that we have. In urban peripheries, the food supplies are, is precarious. There are few farmers markets or open air fairs. Fresh food is generally more expensive and there is little variety available. The supply of ultra-processed products is greater and increasing, and the relative cost of these products is lower comparing to fresh food products. People who live in peripheries generally work far from home. That means they leave home very early and come back late. The supply of health food is limited and physical and financial access is limited. They have little time to buy, prepare, and consume health meals. What initiatives have contributed or could contribute to meeting the challenges of urban food justice? One of them uh, is the National School Meals Program that reach around 40 million students. And uh, uh, they, uh, we offer higher quality meals offered in public schools because 30% of the federal budget uh, this, uh, uh, addressed to this program is, uh, must be uh, to buy uh, from small products, producers. Great, and this, uh, we have great variety and promotion of food culture and uh, there is a restriction of by unhealth programs. Another uh, initiative is a policy to expand urban and peri-urban agriculture as a strategy to reoccupy abundant areas of cities, strengthen community ties, and increase access to health food. Another uh, uh, initiative is the coordination between social assistance, health, and food and nutrition security service to identify people and family at risk, prioritize access to food baskets, community restaurants, food and nutrition education, and health assistance. We have also a new policy that is based in an initiative uh, that was from the civil society organizations that was that was strengthened during the pandemic that we call it solidarity kitchens. Um, the community is responsible for preparing, distribute meals, receiving donations from small produ uh, producers. And this initiative uh, has recently become a public policy and we receive a public budget to maintain its action. We also uh, have, since uh, the last December, a national strategy for food and nutrition security in cities that has among his objectives to reduce inequalities in vulnerability, in vulnerable and social at risk populations, taking into account uh, factors that deepen inequalities uh, as race, gender, and, uh, uh, and income. Uh, this initiative uh, has uh, the aim to contribute to reduce food and nutrition insecurity and all forms of malnutrition. Um, it has among its strategy expand access of, uh, to and availability to consumption of health food. We also have uh, since the last December uh, a decree that established a national food supply policy. And uh, it, among its guidelines, it includes guarantees the human rights to food, encourage agroecology and social biodiversity, strengthen the production of health food by family farmers and the urban and peri-urban agriculture, and uh, the, the plan will prioritize action to people in food insecurity and social vulnerability. 
All these actions uh, will take an intersectional look at race, gender, and social class in order to reduce inequalities, and uh, will prioritize peripheral areas of cities, assisting families headed by women, black women, and families with children under, under 10. I think these were uh, some of initiatives that we are uh, monitoring in our national council and has the potential to reduce food injustice. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was excellent. Really great insights from, from your perspective, from Brazil and internationally in your work. Uh, we're going to move on to the, the final panel panelist, Valerie Bluebird. Gernigan from Oklahoma State University. Valerie is a professor of medicine and rural health, uh, director for the Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy uh, at Oklahoma. Over to you, Valerie. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. My name is Valerie Bluebird Jernigan. I am Choctaw from the Choctaw Nation in Southeastern Oklahoma. And I direct the Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy. I am going to share a little bit about what we're doing with indigenous populations in North America. And I'll be talking mostly about a center that we run, the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity. Next slide. As some of my fellow presenters emphasize, there is a distinction between food justice and food sovereignty. And I like to uh, clarify the definitions. Um, food justice, as folks have emphasized, is really seen as a human right and focuses on addressing those structural barriers um, and the food insecurities that communities face. Food sovereignty is really the space where I work a lot with my indigenous partners. And there are many definitions, but uh, a common definition is a food system where the people who produce the food are also in charge of the processes and policies involving its production, distribution, and consumption. So food sovereignty is really used to empower communities to fight food injustices through various actions, especially grassroots activism and coalition building. Next slide. So I work with indigenous food sovereignty, which is a little bit different, and it adds a focus not just on the right to safe healthy, culturally appropriate foods, but also the responsibility that we as indigenous people have to our ancestral food practices and food ways. We have relational responsibilities. We have a great law or a um, belief, many of us, many of our communities do, that our ancestors made first agreements with the plant and animal relatives that we have to care for them and they in turn will care for us. And so food sovereignty as a community-based movement deeply um, embedded with ind indigenous culture is really about restoring those original agreements. Um, they have held up their end of those agreements and we as human relatives have not held up um, in many cases our agreements. Food sovereignty in an indigenous context is really about um, restoring those original relationships. So both as an indigenous person but also as a health researcher, I was naturally drawn to the indigenous food sovereignty movement because it helps to decrease our dependence on packaged and fast foods that have really um, become pervasive with the, the removal and restriction to reservations that we um, have experienced as a part of colonization. And 
one other benefit of the indigenous food sovereignty movement from a health perspective is that it does address the need for nutrition and health equity approaches that are embedded in an indigenous concept of health and wellness, sovereignty and self-determination. We find that there's a paucity uh, within the scientific and medical and public health literature around uh, theories of change um, within the context of indigenous communities. Indigenous food sovereignty is one such theory or one such approach. Next slide. So within the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity, which is funded by the Office of Minority Health and is a large um, national initiative that focuses on American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations, um, we have many areas where communities are spotlighting and uplifting traditional food ways and practices. And that's what the CEHE, or as we call it, Center for Indigenous Innovation Health Equity, CEHE, is really about. It's about focusing on those grassroots initiatives that maybe are not the, the Western public health intervention models that get uh, a lot of funding. These are really initiatives that are about restoring tradition and culture. The Choctaw Nation, my own tribal nation, has an initiative as part of CEHE, and it's the Growing Hope Initiative. So I chose to share that as a specific example. Uh, the project is sharing seeds that were um, carried during the Trail of Tears when Native communities were forced from the eastern part of the continent to what is now Oklahoma, uh, Indian Territory. And during the Trail of Tears, we kept our seeds from our original homelands and brought them with us. So the Choctaw Nation Growing Home Hope uh, is a project that distributes those seeds and really focuses on uh, mentoring Choctaw youth um, to learn how to restore Cho Choctaw traditional uh, agricultural gardens, community gardens, and individual family gardens. And we are rigorously evaluating the efficacy of these programs on a variety of measures as our goal is really to put into mainstream scientific literature the value of these initiatives um, from a public health perspective. So we are examining access and use uh, within the program, changes in fruit and vegetable access and consumption, transmission of traditional knowledge, and we're administering surveys and interviews to really assess the impact of this uh, initiative. Next slide. Another example is the Osage Nation Mobile Market. Uh, Osage Nation, uh, which is in the northeastern corner of the state of Oklahoma, has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, one of our, uh, the award-winning film, um, Killers of the Flower Moon, is now um, showing, and that is the particular tribe that is, is that story is about, um, that is Osage Nation. They have been um, really active in the food sovereignty space with regards to their launching of their farm. And um, we've worked with them to develop a farm to school initiative, a community supported agricultural initiative, and now our Harvest Land Mobile Market Initiative, which is targeted to uh, Osage Nation citizens who live in very remote areas of the reservation and don't have access to the main farm in Pahuska, this mobile market brings the farm produce to them. And we're looking at program access and use, changes in dietary intake, fruit and vegetables specifically, food insecurity, health-related chronic diseases, and transmission of traditional knowledge, administering surveys, and coordinating with the Osage Nation clinics. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
So this is just a general map um, of our Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity. We currently have uh, nine sites and we just added some additional state. Uh, we have just to uh, conclude my presentation, um, we have example, uh, you can go to the last slide. Yeah, this is the last slide, thanks. Um, and I just have some other examples of the work that we're doing. Um, elders mentoring elders, culture camps in Alaska where elders who were in residential schools are um, learning from other elders who uh, will teach them the cultural foodways and food practices, salmon cutting and moose hide um, tanning, for example, um, farm to school initiatives community um, convenience store makeovers and tribal food hubs. Those are some of the examples in the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity. You can find more information on our website and we have just published a um, focus issue in health promotion practice where you can see case studies of the CEHE initiatives. And I think we have about 14 articles and you can look at the theory of change and the food sovereignty um, approaches that we're taking. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was great to have that absolutely key perspective on indigenous food sovereignty with those uh, fascinating examples from the Choctaw and the Osage Nations um, and, and the links and, uh, to, to other resources. We are... Um, about to move into the Q&A, but uh, prior to that, we have um, a short introduction from Leticia Petrovich from the Food Foundation on the uh, Food Justice Toolkit that we were involved in uh, preparing with Birmingham City Council and Consultants last year, which is online. It's a living resource, which um, uh, Leticia will, will talk about. If um, you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A and then we'll come to those uh, shortly. So handing over to you, Leticia. Great, thank you so much, Stuart. So um, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, Birmingham City Council has just launched a new food system strategy, but also in addition to the food system strategy, we've been continuing our work and involvement with the uh, Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and developing resources to support the Food Justice Pledge. So what we did was developed a database of interventions, policies and strategies that we have identified through literature review that have been implemented worldwide to help policymakers navigate some of these challenges and maximize positive outcomes. So I'm going to try and do a quick demo and share the links afterwards where you'll be able to find some of these resources and then we will move into the Q&A. So if I just share my screen, hopefully this will work. Great. So um, when you open the website, you'll be able to navigate to all of the amazing resources that we have as part of the Birmingham Food Revolution, including the Global Food Justice Toolkit, which uh, will then lead you to all of the resources that you can find on the Food Justice uh, Intervention Database. And the way that we have organized the Intervention Database is essentially looking at five thematic areas that are aligned with the Milan Urban Food Policy policy pact framework. So like interventions on governance, social and economic equity, food production, food supply and distribution, food waste and recycling. And you will be able to essentially click to all of those different thematic areas. And here you will look, you will be able to look at the overview of this particular interventions and all of the different sub themes that um, align with that intervention. And then within the uh, actual kind of overview, you will be able to click and find the download link to the database, which I have already downloaded. So I will be able to just quickly bring that up. 
uh, where you will again be able to filter across all of the different regions, countries, as well as the cities and different sub themes that relate to one of the key um, themes within the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact framework. And within each of those uh, sub themes, you will be able to essentially um, find different interventions that relate to different regions, different countries and different cities. The, you can filter by all of these different uh, columns and you will then also be able to uh, read straight from the database a short description of what um, intervention was actually trying to achieve what were the target populations and any uh, impacts that were uh, that, that, that were uh, recorded to reduce food insecurity um, and what were some of the kind of other health interventions. And there's also a link to additional studies uh, as well as the um, link to the particular intervention paper where those interventions were extracted from. And we have over 400 interventions so we hope this will really be a good uh, useful resource for all of the policymakers as well as the community organizations working on the food system transformation across their cities and um, countries and in addition to that you will also be able to find a self-assessment toolkit which is basically looking at all of those different themes uh, aligning to food justice and allow you to essentially populate that for your locality. So looking at how you are faring against all of those different areas and help you hopefully identify some of the key barriers and challenges in this area, what you can improve. And this is the example of what we did with Birmingham City Council. And then also kind of um, use that to speak to and influence your um, local policymakers on some of the areas that require more support, more funding and collaboration. And I will share the link to all of these resources in the chat. So we're hoping that you are able to um, review this and also help us enrich this database as we want it to be a living resource that we can continue to share and update with cities globally. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Leticia. Yes, so we'll share the link uh, shortly. You'll be able to access that directly. It's on the, I think, on the Food Foundation website as well. You can Google that. Um, so thank you, everyone, the panel, all panel members, for that excellent series of insights from your your various perspectives and contexts. Um, we have now, I think, let's have a look around fourteen minutes or so of Q and A, and um, what I suggest doing is to basically um, raise some questions. I have one question at the moment uh, in the Q&A to panel members. And anybody who would like to pick up on uh, the questions, uh, please do so. The first question we have is from Andrea Moraes. And it's, it's a very important question about the link between community and policy. So sort of uh, local, national. And the question is, um, the panelists have discussed community and policy approaches to food justice. Are there any insights on the relationship between community and policy initiatives um, overall? So anyone who would like to pick that up from their perspective or more generally, please, please go ahead. The relationship between community and policy. So that's as they local and national, how to, how to forge those links for, for scaling up and for, for better learning across different contexts. Maybe you could put your hand up if you are interested in responding. Uh, Karen, please go Yeah, ahead. so yeah, for me, it's always about building relationships, you know, um, and it starts with that and people to understand that um, when it comes to politics and politicians, the most important thing is your right to vote. That's number one. But also when people are in office, you have to make them accountable. You know, being in, in, in New York City at a time whereby I made it my place to make sure that I knew who my local council person was, senator, congress, congressman, you name it. 
and made those relationships and had them come out to my community to talk about some of the issues that were that were happening and make sure that there was accountability. And I think sometimes that doesn't happen. People just complain about, you know, services or lack of services without really reaching out to the local politicians to making sure that they're accountable for what they were voted to do. And so the start is always building relationships. Building relationships can move mountains, and I'll leave it at that. Right. That's excellent. Thank you very much. So I have Taylor and then Valerie and um, Elisabetta. So Taylor first, please. Sure. Um, yeah, so we can try to answer that more from the perspective instead of national to local of, you know, local as city government to folks, you know, that make up our community in Baltimore. Um, and I would say there's a few different things, but I found so one, I, I already had talked about how to, uh, as Karen was just saying, create those relationships like we had already took, you know, 10 years doing that through food pack or resident directory advisors cohort. But I would say what we've really focused on since 2020, when we've had now all of a sudden this influx of, of money to invest in the city's food system is to one, that's ultimately the residents' money. And so to hear from, from the community, how do they want that money spent? And then to get that money out into the community. So like of our $11 million ARPA investment, almost all of that money is not, the city's not used, we're not using it for ourselves as city government, we're giving it to our community partners. And a couple of key things there that are also challenges um, are we're very focused right now on land, long-term land tenure for our urban farms. Um, Baltimore has a lot of vacant land and we have a lot of uh, great urban farms, but many of them are in very short-term leases on city-owned land and that's not okay. Um, and so we're really, exploring different avenues of how to get them funding from the city to actually purchase their land. Um, and then another uh, example is we've worked um, very closely for a number of years now with the Blackfield Institute in Baltimore and their efforts to open the Cherry Hill Food Co-op. Uh, we don't act, we don't have any food co-ops in Baltimore City right now. Um, and that is obviously a community-led effort in sort of just shifting the mindset of city government as opposed to attracting and retaining grocery stores that are, you know, owned by large private corporations that are really only concerned with profit and can close at any time to sort of shifting to community-led and operated and funded uh, food retail. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Taylor. Valerie? I would say policy is tricky with indigenous populations because um, we have, you know, over 575 federally recognized indigenous nations uh, on the continent of the U.S. And um, they're all very different, different government structures, different cultures, different contexts. So policy has been uh, actually difficult because state and federal policies tend to not include American Indian Alaska Natives in the data sets that drive those policies. So we're not represented in terms of our needs. Our populations are so small that we tend to be categorized as other if we're collected in terms of data sets at all. So sometimes policies that have targeted states or federal policies can exacerbate disparities. And we've seen that with the tobacco um, free movements. Um, and we're seeing that with food movement as well. So we've had to focus a lot on policy inclusion with tribes, as well as data inclusion with tribes, um, making sure we're represented in the data. But we've also had a challenge with accountability. I think there are a lot of really excellent policies that have been passed but they are not implemented and or their implementation is very, very, um, you know, different across states and has a limited impact on tribes. So working at the tribal government is really where we have focused mostly with my research center. And um, that has really needed an emphasis on data that includes costs of initiatives, 
potential value of initiatives over time in terms of savings and healthcare. So we have shifted to do a lot of cost benefit analyses and worked with health economists to really tell tribes, you know, if you implement these policies, um, these initiatives and scale them to policy, these are the potential savings in terms of costs that you'll see in your healthcare systems. And tribes have been more receptive to that when they've seen um, kind of the long-term value. So that's what we've been focusing on. Great, thank you. Um, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth, before you speak, just one question that's come directly to you uh, from Lydia. Um, she asks whether the hunger agenda in Brazil is at risk of being appropriated by large food corporations, as they have done with the sustainability agenda. Um, and the CEO of JBS, the Brazilian meat giant, has just announced hunger as a top priority for the corporation's engagement with the G20 in Rio. So if you have any additional thoughts on that in response, that would be great. Over to you. Well, <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, I think that the risk is not only in Brazil, but uh, in the global uh, dimension, because uh, if you, we analyze what's happening with uh, the corporative capture of the agenda of uh, right to food or the transformation of food systems, yes, we are at risk, not in Brazil, only in Brazil, but uh, we are uh, facing this in the global perspective. And the, the only way to face this risk is by social participation and uh, to define, and that this is really difficult, to define some uh, protocols to prevent conflict of interest in the decisions of uh, public policies. If we see what is happening in multilateral spaces, for example, uh, the private sector is very strong in the last years and uh, is very strong now. And so I have only one answer for this, the social participation and the public spaces uh, free of conflict of interest. But uh, I would like to make two, two points about the first question. One of them is, um, if we, I, I think not only in Brazil, but in some countries, during the pandemic, because we have a very uh, important experiences from civil society organizations when the governments are absent for prevent uh, uh, not only deaths from COVID, but uh, prevent the uh, raising of hunger. And uh, the policy that I mentioned before, that solidarity kitchens, it's one of the examples. And uh, for this, I think that we also need formal spaces for social participation. This is the only way to have process and we have mechanisms from civil society organizations to be heard in the spaces that uh, public policies are being planned and implemented. Thank you. We, you are muted, Stuart. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm muted, sorry. Um, right, we have one final question from Amanda, uh, making the distinction between food justice and food sovereignty. What would you say have been some of the most impactful ways that city governments have supported or aligned with food justice and food sovereignty efforts? I think that's quite a general question, but if you have any final Thoughts, any of you on that, that would that would be great. Yeah, like I said, you know, it's gonna the the voices and the power is gonna be in the hands of the community. Uh for so long, uh we have been sitting in the back seat, allowing the government to change our food system. They have effed it up big time. And so the strength and the power of change is gonna come within the communities and you're starting to see communities taking back their food system, growing food. And also um, uh, like um, Valerie was saying, I think people are now starting to have that conversation about the historical content on how food was grown in this country. Um, and also going back to um, just 
indigenous principles, you know, the way we used to grow food. And so, again, <clears throat> justice, sovereignty is going to be in the hands of the community. My two cents. Right. Anyone else? We are, uh, we have a few more minutes. If anybody, let me just check to see if there are any late coming questions in here. Uh, oh, here we have one. One final question. Um, how can we collectively advocate for food justice in situations of genocide in Gaza, Congo, Sudan? Maybe a joint statement from MUFPP delegations. Any thoughts on that? Crisis and conflict, food justice, advocacy um, from MUFPP. That's something to consider. It may not be a direct uh, uh, response or thoughts now, but okay. What we not seeing any hands on that. Oh, there's a long question here. We we have one more question. One time for one more question. We have been talking on how we can face challenges from specific communities. Um, such as black communities and indigenous groups, how can we escalate traditional or ancestral practices to other communities and countries or cities where they're not present? How can we replicate their practices without disrespecting them? That's from Montserrat. I think that there's an there could be an overemphasis on scale up and replication. And that's something I've learned over time because it's such a focus in public health. But a lot of our indigenous traditions and practices are very place-based and they actually come from long um, lines of ancestral knowledge. So I think the first step is really to educate ourselves about what those practices are in those communities and contexts. You can see some movement toward that with land acknowledgements and the recognition of the lands upon which people live, work and play. And I think that helps to um, provide a bit of education around what those traditional uh, practices actually are. And then I think connecting with the local um, uh, caretakers of that land and um, learning about, you know, how um, they engaged in sustainable agriculture for so long with their indigenous knowledge is a really good place to start um, and integrating those kinds of practices within your own household. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh... That has been excellent and a uh, great discussion, great presentations. Uh, I won't try and summarize everything. It would be impossible, but some really interesting insights on the key issues and concepts and practices around food justice, food sovereignty, food apartheid, this notion of um, whether the food system is broken or it's just the wrong system, it needs to be overhauled, it can't be repaired. I think that is a key concern. I, I've worked a lot in food systems and I keep seeing time and time again this focus on food trans, food system transformation. And the reality is when you look at it, it's more of the same. It's business as usual. It's just tweaking at the margins rather than any serious overhaul, which is what transformation means. So I think we have to call these things, call these uh, deceits out uh, when they happen. Um, it's been going on for too, for too long. And Another important part that came up um, towards the end was the, the issue of corporate capture of our food systems. And again, we're seeing that more and more. We saw it with the UN Food Systems Summit of 2021. At least uh, a lot of us felt that way about uh, that particular event and the process around that. And that needs to be, a light needs to be shone on that and, and the way that is playing out because that's fundamentally about power power imbalances, equity, and ultimately about food justice. Um, and I think these insights and these perspectives and the positive stories that go along with, with, with your experience in, the, in different contexts is absolutely essential for, for building on that and, and uh, moving towards real, real change. So thank you again.
very much. Uh, I just want to check with Leticia and Serena if you have any other final thoughts from Food Foundation or MUFPP. Please say so now. I would just like to thank everyone for joining and uh, for enriching this knowledge exchange that we are fostering and I'm hoping some of you will be able to join us for our last webinar on the 13th to hear the perspectives from Asia as well and we hope that this is not the end obviously the webinar series and the fellowship um, will run for the end of the year but we will be looking at new opportunities and different ways of knowledge exchange and learning to make sure that um, we are really tackling this as a global issue and um, I've learned so much that I'm going to take away and take and see how we can apply that in Birmingham context. So thank you so much. Right, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to to the Food Foundation for and to the city for participating. Great, thank you, Serena. And thanks everyone again. It was a great session. And as mentioned, the next regional webinar, 13th of March on Asia, you're very welcome and you'll be, we'll send links out. Uh, to join that uh, session. And thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.